94.3 The Dude is very grateful to our men and women in uniform. We're proud to recognize local members of our military by turning the spotlight on them right now in our Soldier Salute. I'm your host, United States Marine Corps veteran Ethan Stitch Gardner, and on today's Soldier Salute, I have recipient of the Purple Heart and United States Army Airborne Infantry veteran Scott Craig. Scott, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for your service. Tell the listeners and I your story and what led you to the United States Army. I was always going to be in the Army. You know, little seven, ten-year-old Scott running around Halloween, playing G.I. Joe. It was just something I was always going to do. Turns out when I was about 19 years old, I was homeless, jobless, nothing else to do, and it was finally time Time to join. So I went to the recruiter's office and he was like, Hey, you tested well. Let's get you in the Patriot Missile Systems operator. I was like, Nah, man, that's, that's not for me. I want to be in the infantry. He's like, Dude, you, you sure? Yeah, yeah, go infantry. He signed me up. I went down to Georgia. I got to spend my 20th birthday in basic training. Went on to airborne school after that. That's so funny. All too often, I hear people score very high scores on the ASVAP and their end goal is to always go join the infantry just want to be in the infantry. I just want to fight for my country and fight for the freedoms that I enjoy so much. What units did you go on to serve with? My first deployment was with the 173rd. We were in Germany. It's been a 15-month deployment at Camp Keating. After that one was done, I went to Fort Bragg, spent some time in the 82nd as a White Falcon. They rolled on to go to the Haiti mission when they had the earthquake back in 2009. And then I moved on to the 10th Mountain down in Fort Polk, Louisiana, and I did another 12-month deployment to Afghanistan in Logar Province. That's where I I got shot in 2007, but the injury that put me out of the service, I got in 2011, three days before coming home. So that was fun. Went through my medical retirement, and I've been an Army spouse basically ever since. So I did seven years, seven years as as an infantryman, and then another seven years as an Army spouse. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for your service. You spent your 20th birthday in United States Army boot camp. I was lucky enough to spend my 20th birthday at Marine Corps boot camp. The difference in our story is I kept it really quiet. Yeah, I, I was in basic training. It was our first week in basic training. So it's right out. We're red hat. We're wearing the helmets without the covers, and we just look dopey. And the only reason you're in basic training that first week is to do push-ups. So I spent my 20th birthday in the front leading rest since I let everybody know, everybody else got cake. That's really? just the way the drill sergeants roll. Yeah. You didn't even get cake on I didn't even get cake on my birthday. Wow. That's kind of a, yeah. that's kind of a low blow, right? I mean, like, you get hazed a little bit, yeah. whatever, got to do it. I don't even get cake. So what happened in basic training after that is people just started getting cake anyway. So when one person would get cake. Why are all these people getting cake? Just, they offered it during the chow hall, but it was one of those you better not touch it because we'll make you pay for it later. Exactly. Well, once the one guy started getting cake every day, everybody started getting cake. So it was our running platoon thing is just get cake at Chow Hall and we're going to suck anyway. So you might as well get that little bit of sugar. So you guys were really, really in shape platoon. We were really in shape, but the drill sergeants figured out a solution. When we started getting cake, they started putting gravy on it. Oh. Right. So it was... Kind of take some of that flavor. It was like our cornbread. Our cornbread was cake with gravy. Did you end up losing a lot of weight at boot camp? I lost like 30 pounds at Marine Corps. Yeah, I lost 50 pounds at boot camp. I was a svelte 190 pounds when I got out of basic training. Yeah, I got pretty fast. Although (laughs) my fastest two mile time was only ever 1430. So I was still one of the slow kids, even though I lost 50 pounds. Scott, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for your service. You served from 2006 to 2013 and you married your wife, who is also in the army. You've been an army spouse for seven years now. I mean, it sounds like a great time. I mean, being an army spouse is sometimes harder than being in the army. When you're in the army, somebody tells you where to be, what uniform to be on, where the bad guys are. But as an army spouse, I mean, you're supposed to be getting the chores done, getting the kids ready, and then there's Netflix. It's difficult because you're you're a lot more self-promoted. You're a lot more independent. For example, I'm now a student as well as being an army spouse. So one of my spring semesters, my wife had to deploy. So I had three kids at the house all by myself, families in Pennsylvania, trying to keep five classes down at the same time. What are those challenges like? Because you've gone from two combat deployments, hard charger, warfighter, to I'm a stay-at-home dad now while my my wife's out fighting the army fight. Those challenges have got to be a lot more complicated than... Than they see. Yeah, and, and right after I got retired out of the Army for being injured, we moved to Germany, above all, so we didn't have any family support, new country, new location, new job title. I spent some time in a nonprofit called Friends of the 66. It was a military booster club, so we did charity work and we raised money for soldiers who were deployed downrange. 
and other veterans initiatives like scholarship funds and stuff. I've leaned into my parenting as a stay-at-home dad and I spent time volunteering. I'm expecting my first kid. I'm super, super excited about it. That time as a military spouse, spending it with the kids and the family, that's got to be priceless. Yeah, it was nice reconnecting. My first deployment, my daughter was seven months old when I deployed, and I didn't get to see her basically for a whole year. So I spent a lot of time repenting for not being there, and I got to spend a lot of quality time with my daughter and my son. Scott, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for your service. You're a veteran of Cop Keating, Combat Outpost Keating. It is one of the most dangerous places in the world. It's a combat outpost at the base of three very tall mountains. It's not a very good tactical situation to be in, but it's the place that the Army needed to be at that time. Tell us about being deployed in the most dangerous part of the world. Yeah, so when people talk about easy as shooting fish in a barrel, well, we were in that barrel. They had three mountains, our north face to our south. The enemy was daily launching rockets at us. We had an outpost a couple clicks higher than us on the back, OP Fritchie, which is our observation post. And at best, we would keep 20 people up there. And we had optics and a couple machine guns. And it was just trying to find the bad guys, putting in mortar rounds, putting in rockets who were attacking us. We didn't have a lot of support up there. The roads were always washed out. You couldn't drive there. Helicopters would only fly when it was pitch black because anytime they would fly, they'd get shot at. They've shot down a couple helicopters while I was there. It was mostly a lot of just leaning on your brothers, making sure they had your back and you had their back, and just making out alive. The camaraderie in a situation like that. I mean, we talk about guys in the military having this, this brotherhood and this camaraderie that's so strong, and it's because of sacrifice and hardship that we have that camaraderie. In those scenarios, I mean, you must have gained friends that you never forget. Yeah, the best part about those bonds are, even if you don't talk to those people for years, when you hit them up, they're there for you. And it's, it's that kind of brothership and fellowship that when you get out of the Army, you lose. And it's a, it's a struggle. It's probably the hardest part about getting out of the Army was losing that, that base of brothers to depend on, you know, night or day for anything. Scott, thanks so much for being here. You're a recipient of the Purple Heart. I can't thank you enough for your service and the sacrifices that you've given for us here at home. The day that you earned your Purple Heart, you did some really, really brave things getting it, and you earned a pretty funny nickname out of the story. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, <laughs> Five Hole, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a nickname I earned on the 27th of July in 2007. Our squadron commander pushed the coin operation, the counterinsurgency operations, so we were on the, the lead of that kind of war fighting. And what we were doing is we went out to a town that wasn't visited by Americans before, and we led a shura with our village elders, trying to turn bad guys into good guys. It's it's a meeting with, you know, just leaders, like a town hall. It's like a city council. And unfortunately, the bad guys got advance notice that we were coming, and they met us there, five to one strong. We lost two Americans that day. Most of us got shot. They fought for hours, waiting for air support and medevac, because we were so far out in the boondocks that you just couldn't get help. So we, we were on a fight for our lives and by ourselves. I got shot because we had one platoon of 20 dudes sitting on a mountaintop, a click out behind us on top of a ridge. When we started getting overrun, they needed fire support, and I was a mortarman. I could provide that fire support. The only way I could do that was by sitting in the middle of a road, completely exposed, launching mortar rounds as a high value target, and providing cover for my friends up on the ridge. Fortunately, I had a quick trigger, shot most of my rounds off, and when I ran out 20 some odd rounds later, I stood up like, hey, where, where's the rest of my bullets? Bring them to me. The moment I stood up, I took a round in the rear. It, uh, <laughs> it went in my right cheek, out my right cheek, into my left cheek. It's awesome that we can like yeah. terrifying firefight and talk about how you got shot in the butt. Yeah, it was a through and through and through and through with one, <laughs> with one bullet. But, you know, a half second earlier, and it would have been head high. So you try to find levity in the situation. Scott, thanks for being here. Thanks for your service. A couple weeks back, the University of South Carolina became the first university in South Carolina to recognize Purple Heart recipients that are attending the university with a honorary parking spot. Now, the parking spot is very, very symbolic. It's very important. It's literally one spot, but it gives you the opportunity to park almost anywhere on campus. Yeah, so the Student Veterans Association on campus and the Veterans Alumni Council worked with 
the Purple Heart Association here in South Carolina, they set it up so that parking would be more accessible for Purple Heart recipients. And what that means is on campus, there's only one spot, but when you go to the parking office, you get a Purple Heart pass instead of a student or a graduate student or a faculty spot. And it allows you to park anywhere on the campus you need to. I'm disabled vet, so I need access to more parking spaces so I can make it up the hill from Swearingen, all the way up the hill back to, you know, LeConte to take my math classes at the Horseshoe. Yeah, that's exhausting. Student Veterans Association, Bobby Herpel, he was on the show a couple weeks back. Brooks Herring, everybody knows Brooks Herring, he's the king of Columbia. But he just threw on that the nonprofit race for the Fisher's House. Yeah, the 5K. That was a really good time. I was there. First 5K I've ran in probably four years. Mm-hmm. Didn't go very well. And I think they raised like $16,000 for they the did. Fisher House they for the VA. $16,000 is pretty awesome. Scott, there's this thing that I keep hearing about, and obviously it's got to be true. In your time in the Army, you lost an inch. You were six foot. Now you're five foot eleven. Right when I when I joined the army, I was six foot tall and a little 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 extra. So I keep hearing this story over and over of guys that are like, "Yeah, I lost an inch in the military. Yeah, I lost an inch in the military." And I was like, "No, that's that's not a thing." More and more I hear about it, the more I, it's got to be true. Tell me about this. So as part of being a, a paratrooper, is you get to jump out of airplanes, but it's not like skydiving. You're attached to a parachute that's designed to get you to the ground as quickly as possible to get you into the fight as quickly as possible. What that means is the ground also comes to you as quickly as possible. They were built for World War II guys, not 200 plus six foot tall guys with 100 pound rucksacks between your legs. If you dropped a sack of potatoes from your roof, that's about how hard I hit every time I landed. So now that I'm out, I found out that I've got a bunch of compressed discs, I've got some herniated discs, and I went from six foot tall to five eleven and a quarter, which means I can't round it up anymore to six foot tall. I'm I'm now a five eleven man. Do you have pain in your entire spine from losing that inch? I mean, is it is it bearable? Is it? Yeah, I have arthritis, plantar fasciitis, disc joint pain, herniated discs. All of my bones are rattled, if you will. I can live with it. I'm being taken care of by the VA, and they're helping keep me medicated and functional. Scott, thanks for being here. Thanks for your service. On your second combat deployment, you deployed when your first child was six months old. You were going off to a combat deployment. You knew what was at stake. Tell me about the emotions and the feeling of walking away from a brand new wife and a six-month-old baby girl thinking in your head, hopefully this isn't the last time. So you steal yourself. You know what's coming. You know what your job is. You know what you're supposed to be doing. You get ready for it. Not only did we have a six-month-old My wife was also pregnant at the time. So you know the mission at hand, and when you start thinking about home, it's what gets people killed. So you don't think about it. You call home, tell everybody hi, you get back to the mission. What was really hard was during that deployment, my daughter Kaylin, my second daughter, uh, she got sick in utero. The army doctors missed some water on her brain on an ultrasound, and disease ended up taking my daughter. And I had to fight with the army to get leave to come back, help my wife through the stillbirth, and then fight to get leave extended so I could bury my daughter. And then a couple days later, I had to go back to Afghanistan. Uh, So I had to go back into the fight and push it off and compartmentalize and just push through the rest of the deployment. I left when my daughter was about six months, a little over. My daughter had her first birthday without me, and that's when we lost our other daughter. So I flew back in that March, helped bury my daughter, and then I went back for another six months, and I came back to a wife and a year and a half old daughter who didn't know who I was. It was tough. Coming off of a very, very hard first combat deployment mm-hmm. in a cop Keating, the most dangerous place in the world, going off to your second deployment, it was a combat zone. It was it was hard fighting again. Yeah, we were in we were in firefights daily. But these these are struggles that every service member goes through. My first deployment I had a buddy who got shot, went through his shoulder, bounced off his back plate, bounced off his front plate, just ricocheted inside him. They stabilized him, they got him back to Texas, and he died a couple days before his daughter was born, his firstborn. And uh, think about Chris Daly. Scott, thanks for your service, thanks for being here. Your original dream wasn't to be a hard-charging, war-fighting mortarman, it was to be a medevac pilot. I've had conversations with numerous medevac pilots from Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, some from Korea. That's almost just as dangerous of a job as what you went out there and did for almost a decade. What stopped you in that dream? Yeah, back 13-year-old Scott playing G.I. Joe on Halloween. I was also drawing Apaches my whole childhood. It's what I wanted to do my whole life is fly a helicopter. Um, so at the recruiting station, I talked about becoming a pilot. I was like, infantry, I'll get my sergeant. 
I'll do my four years, go to flight school, become a warrant officer, and start flying Apaches and blowing stuff up. After I got wounded, watching what those Blackhawk pilots did, they were amazing. You know, they'd come over, they'd be getting shot at, bullets ripping through the sides of them, and they'd be doing their mission and getting people out and saving lives. And that changed wanting to be an Apache pilot to being a Blackhawk pilot. I wanted to fly medevacs. Just circumstance. I took my flight aptitude test, nailed it. Did my flight physical, nailed it. But the Department of the Defense changed my orders to go to the 82nd. Had to put it off for a year. Met my wife, had a newborn, had to re-enlist, follow her. New unit, year off till I could go to flight school. Then I'm in Afghanistan, three days out from coming home from deployment. Blew out my knee, dodging mortar rounds. Medically retired. <sighs> Never made it to flight school. You do have an illustrious, valorous combat career. Would you give it all up? Not a, not a second of it. I'd do it all again in a heartbeat, and I think a lot of vets would. Thanks for joining us in our Soldier Salute, presented by Little Pig's Barbecue, serving Columbia since 1963 with that bodacious buffet, and Palmetto State Armory, American-made for life, and Franklin Equipment. Rent, buy, rely, and Atkins Law Firm Workers' Comp Attorneys. Who you hire matters.